Don't forget to like, comment, share and subscribe and do consider supporting the channel via PayPal or Patreon. You'll find the links in the video description. Round 9 of the Chess Olympiad in Chennai. Armenia were just out in front. They had a tricky match against Uzbekistan. Now, they're another team of young stars on their first board. They have Nodibek Abdusatorov. You might remember the name. He is the current World Rapid Play champion, just 17 years old. And board three, they have a 16-year-old, Javahir Sindarov, 16 years old. He played, became a grandmaster at the age of 12, um, at that time, one of the youngest in the world. Anyway, let's have a look at this game. Sindarov against Ter Sahakian uh, from Armenia. And it's an open Sicilian, and Ter Sahakian plays the Nidorf. Now, Sindarov doesn't play one of the, the sharpest lines. You know, bishop e3, bishop g5 lead to really critical positions. Instead, he played bishop d3. Quite a solid move. You know, you're not attempting to checkmate black right from the outset. Uh, I'll come back and discuss different options uh, at this moment, but... Anyway, let's continue with the game. e5, the typical Nidorf move, setting up this, these central pawns, and knocks the knight back. And bishop e7, castles, all pretty regular so far. Bishop e6, and f4. So white is, is set up for this move, and yeah, if you can get in f5 that might be quite nice so that gets taken off and the knight well it's it's made quite a few moves so far in this game but it spins round to a pretty good square on f4 knight c6 now it's possible to take that bishop off uh, some of us who like the bishops very much will be tempted to do that and play bishop c4 michael adams uh, english number one player played like this previously um you know, I, I really think that's a little bit better for white. Certainly more comfortable. But Sindarov played a, an unusual move. B3. You don't often see the queenside fianchetto in the open Sicilian. But it's very reasonable. It's okay. The bishop is, is on, certainly on a good diagonal. Knight E5. Well, now we can see the drawback of advancing with F4. It does give that knight a beautiful square on e5 that really binds black's position together. Queen e1 from white. You never know that queen might pop up over here at some moment. I, th I think rook c8 is a very reasonable move here just to put some pressure on the c file because, you know, once you play b3, then it means that white is always a little bit vulnerable on the c file. But rook e8 plate, it's also... A good move and bishop f8 and this traditional sort of curl up on the on the king side means the bishop can protect the king and the rook has some influence on the e-file rook d1 g6 yeah b i think b5 is an interesting move here but anyway g6 so super solid on the king side and then rook c8 bishop g7 yeah i mean this this is a very nice kingside setup, has to be said. Knight a4. Okay, so the knight is looking to spin in here. Queen e7 and knight b6 and rook c6. At this moment, it's, it's interesting to exchange on e5, actually. I mean, I think this certainly gives white, you know, a, a, a little advantage that is a strong piece on d5 and you might be able to support it with either the c pawn or potentially later on uh, a bishop as well but uh, sindarov keeps more control bishop d4 queen c7 now there's pressure building pressure here and pressure on c2 what white would very much like to do is play c4 establishing a bind on the position, particularly with the knight on b6. But there's a problem because black can exchange on d3 and take on e4. You can see the queen is hit, it's an extra pawn. 
So the queen drops back to g1, so that takes the queen out of the range of the knight, although, you know, it doesn't look like such an active move. And, and this is actually a very important position in the game, and, and this is so typical of Sicilian positions, where there can be just one moment where the game turns. So here, knight takes is the best move. Now, you can't take this because there's a nasty fork. But after rook takes, knight takes e4. Now, white has enough compensation here, but certainly this is what black should play. Um, I suspect he was worried about this move, and, and this leads to... Um, a, it's a very forcing continuation, actually. Black has to take here, white has two rooks against rook and knight, but black has two pawns. Um, it should end in a draw with best play, but I mean, maybe he was worried about that. It's hard to say. I mean, that's, that's a very long variation. Certainly, you know, white has compensation. Maybe that's all that uh, Tess Hakian saw, that somehow white should be all right there. He played queen e7. <clears throat> but I think... You know, that's a kind of, it's a, it's a half move, as Korchnoi liked to say. You know, there's no real intent behind the move. And after c4, finally white gets this move in and it's safe in this position. And that really cramps black. Now black has, well, struggles to find counterplay in this position. Nice position. I mean, I'm normally a big fan of hedgehog positions where you strike out, but it's not so easy to strike out in this position. And taking here doesn't work. After this, check. So check, and the knight hangs. And when the knight comes back, then, well, the, the pin is too much, basically. So knight fd7. The knight comes to d5. Queen h4, the bishop comes back. Just kicking the queen. And now the players repeat moves. <clears throat> I, I think Teos Akian should have played queen g5 here. And, well, he's he. there's no need for white to repeat. You know, white could play bishop b1. But black can strike out here. White is definitely better in this position. I mean, that is a fantastic piece on d5. But it's really not so clear after black has broken out with b5. But after this move, instead of queen g5, the queen retreated to h6, and that's really not a good square. Bishop g3, queen f2, and this little rearrangement of white pieces has certainly been successful. Watch out for a, for a bishop h4. Trapping that queen. So the queen had to fall back and now, bang, a4. That is such an important move. Just clamping down on the counterplay. Now it is, I mean, that was played very, very quickly. I'm sure Sindarov appreciated exactly what was going on in, in this position. That now it is very difficult for black to find any decent counterplay. Rook came back to c8, bishop c2, why not? That's actually a, quite an important piece. Just stop some exchanges. Rook f8, I mean, you can see with these moves, this is really an indication that black is struggling to find any active play. Well, I'm just going to pause for a moment, have a little slurp of tea. And I'm going to ask you, how would you play with white in this position? It's all very well having this pleasant space advantage. It's not clear where black is playing, but what do you do with white? Cheers. Are you ready? Very nice move, this. Knight e3, opening up the d-file but also looking to slam that knight in on f5. When you've got so much space and your pieces are so active, 
this sacrifice looks very tempting. Knight c5, so that defends this. But knight f5 comes, and this really is very powerful. Um, I mean, even if this, this is taken with the bishop, having got rid of the light squared bishop, then the knight can return here, and you know f6 is coming. This this is very very difficult for black. Tessa Hakian took the piece and retreated the bishop, and now knight h5, and and simple threat to play f6, opening up that bishop, and well, white's king is not going to survive if f6 comes. So that's why black played f6. What an ugly move. Shutting in the bishop, also weakening that square. And as it turns out, b4 actually traps the knight. Well, I say traps the knight, not, not quite. It's possible to take that pawn, but this actually loses material after this. And bishop a4, pin and win. Um, black is not going to survive that one. Um, or f takes e5, this is also absolutely hopeless, f6 and so on. So after b4, black just gave the knight back. But positionally, black is absolutely dead in this position. Um, that square is a terrible weakness, the d pawn is weak. The king now lacks cover. All white pieces are well placed. Bishop h6, bishop f4. Takes, takes. You see that knight is ready to hop in to e6, and that is a true octopus. c5, that just exploits the pin on the d file. If that's taken, then bishop c4 is absolutely crushing. So rook takes, uh, excuse me, knight takes, rook takes, and there's a pin on the d-file. Rook d6, now white is a pawn up. And the octopus lands in the middle of black's position. Really nasty. So white's a pawn up with a crushing position. I like the way Sindarov finishes this. Look at this move. King here, very tidy. Let's just go back. Um, was possible to take this off here, but there's a problem that the queen is threatened and rook d8 and, and a swift checkmate. That's why queen h3 uh, wasn't played. Um, so smart calculation there. But rook e8, but king h2, just very tidy just preventing here there's there's no need to rush things and the king is absolutely safe so rook e7 rook d4 up oh, here we go the rook swinging up the board looks pretty nasty rook h4 queen comes down queen d4 Ooh. hitting f6 rook f7 and after rook d8 black resigned why did black resign? Let's just continue a little bit. Well, obviously there is weakness on the back rank. Let's see how white exploits this. Let's say queen f1. There's not much that black can do against this. Takes, takes, queen d8, hits the bishop. So the queen comes back and now knight c7. Hitting queen and bishop. I mean, obviously black can take this, but that is absolutely hopeless. Hopeless white has a completely winning position with rook against bishop and uh, an overwhelming position as well. So uh, I think a, a game that turned on a few key moments, um, once a4 had been played, then this bind is just too much for black actually. That's, that's a dream position for white. Um, but you know, here was an important moment where black is still in the game after queen g5 and b5. And coming back here, then black should have taken that bishop as well.
a, a very tense game in all its stages. Coming right back to the opening, yes, e5 is a decent move, but I like g6 in this position, which is a kind of dragon Nidorf hybrid, you know, with these, these two moves, except that with the bishop on d3, this avoids all the sharpest lines of the Yugoslav attack um, in, in the dragon. So, uh, you know, and in, the, in this case, I always feel that black is very comfortable. But again, this is a question of taste, of course. Anyway, back to the proceedings in the Olympiad, because that uh, win for uh, Sindarov propelled Uzbekistan to a, a, a crushing 3-1 victory over Armenia. Um, it could have been even more. Abdul Satorov drew on board one. I thought he had a tremendous position. Uh, but anyway, 3-1, convincing victory for Uzbekistan. And they now go into the lead. Uzbekistan 16 points, Armenia 15. India 2 also 15 points. India 2 had a... a a roller coaster of a match against Azerbaijan, 2-2. Uh, Gukesh, our man on 8 out of 8, only drew against Mamadyarov. Well, Mamadyarov, what a player. Uh, Gukesh, slightly better in that game, but um, Mamadyarov held firm. So, yeah, Gukesh, his 100% record has gone now. But, yeah, India 2 still very much in, a sh in, in with a shout. Uh, with 15 points, Uzbekistan in the lead, 16 points. Just two rounds to go. Um, one little advertisement I should mention that Chessable have some courses on sale just till the end of the Olympiad. There we go, Chessable. Um, including my Kalashnikov course, do check it out. This is the time to get it if you're interested in the Kalashnikov course. I'll put the link downstairs in downstairs down below in the comments. Thanks for watching. More coming soon tomorrow.